Good morning, good morning, good people. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak to Dr. Matthew T. Huber on his latest publication, Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. And on this fun drive Friday, I'll have my favorite person and yours later in the show. But first, the news. I'm Christina Onestead with KPFA News Headlines. Ukraine has launched its first war crimes trial of a Russian soldier accused of shooting a civilian during the first war's first week. 21-year-old Sergeant Vadim Shishimayrin stands accused of shooting a 62-year-old man in the head. He faces up to life in prison. The United Nations Human Rights Council has approved a resolution calling for an investigation into human rights abuses and violations in northern Ukraine. The vote was 33 to 2 with China and Eritrea opposing it. Twelve other nations abstained. Eileen Alfandari reports. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights said her office continued to verify allegations of violations of human rights and humanitarian laws, many of which may amount to war crimes. Michelle Bachelet said most of the casualties have been caused by Russian soldiers and their allies. The scale of unlawful killings, including indicia of summary executions in areas to the north of Kiev, is shocking. These killings of civilians often appear to be intentional carried out by snipers and soldiers. There were instances of rape and murder of victims or their relatives. Ukraine's first deputy minister of foreign affairs, Emin Zaporova, held up a drawing of dark scribbles by an 11-year-old boy who was reportedly raped in Bucha by Russian troops while his mother was tied to a chair and forced to watch. These have been 10 weeks of sheer horror to the people of my country. Thousands of people in my country have lost their lives, more than 200 children among them. The resolution directs an existing commission investigating human rights violations in Ukraine to look into crimes committed in the Kyiv, Chernihiv, Kharkiv and Sumy regions in late February and early March after Russia's invasion. I'm Eileen Alfandari for Pacifica Radio. The European Union's foreign affairs chief says the EU will give Ukraine another $520 million to buy heavy weapons to fend off the Russian invasion. In the U.S., Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul single-handedly delayed Senate approval of an additional $40 billion in military, economic and humanitarian aid for Ukraine. He said the new spending would deepen federal deficits and worsen painful inflation. It pushes a final Senate passage of the bill off to next week. Nationwide student walkouts took place Thursday in protest of the anticipated rollback of abortion rights. Not the church, not the state, people will decide their fate. Youth walked out of Seattle classrooms and thousands took to the streets in New York City and others across the country. It comes after a leaked draft Supreme Court opinion that overturns the landmark abortion rights ruling Roe v. Wade. Activists across the U.S. are staging die-ins today and nationwide protests are planned Saturday. In Washington, D.C. and major cities across the country, locally, activists will gather for a ban off our bodies march and rally starting at 10 a.m. at San Francisco's Civic Center. In Mountain View, people will gather starting at 11 a.m. Saturday at 600 Evelyn Avenue. And in San Jose, people will gather at 11 a.m. Saturday. Activists will also gather in Los Angeles starting at 10 a.m. And in Fresno at 9 a.m. at West Knees Avenue and North Blackstone. The Biden administration says it's canceling three oil and gas lease sales scheduled in the Gulf of Mexico and off the coast of Alaska that will remove millions of acres from possible oil and gas drilling. This comes as gas prices reach record highs. The Interior Department cites a lack of industry interest in drilling off the Alaska coast and conflicting court rulings that have complicated drilling efforts in the Gulf of Mexico. That's where the bulk of offshore drilling takes place. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki he says there's plenty of leased land oil companies can already drill but aren't.
of the more than 10.9 million offshore acres currently under lease, industry is not producing on 8.26 million acres. That's about 7.75, more than 75% that is non-producing. Of the 24.9 million onshore acres under lease, industry is not producing on 12.3 million acres. That's almost 50%. And there are also over 9,000 onshore permits that have been approved and are waiting to be used onshore. So just to reiterate, while we expect, uh, U.S. production is expected to increase by over 1 million barrels uh, a day this year and hit a new record uh, record uh, next year. The decision likely means the Biden administration will not hold a lease sale for offshore drilling this year. The UK's Guardian is reporting several oil and gas giants are planning to ramp up fossil fuel production that would defeat the global goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions enough to avoid catastrophic climate change. The plants include 195 carbon bombs, gigantic oil and gas projects that would each result in at least a billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions over over their lifetimes, equal to 18 years of current global carbon dioxide emissions. 60% of those projects have already started pumping oil and gas. The dozen biggest oil companies are on track to spend $103 million a day for the rest of the decade exploiting new fields of oil and gas, the report says. Southern California Edison has told state utility regulators electrical circuit activity happened at about the same time a wildfire erupted in the coastal community of Laguna Niguel that burned at least 20 multi-million dollar homes. The commission last year approved a settlement of more than half a billion dollars in fines and penalties for Southern California Edison for the role its equipment had in five wildfires from 2017 to 2018. Meanwhile, the National Weather Service reported winds yesterday at 40 miles per hour. Orange County Fire Chief Brian Fennessy said those winds were gusty but not unusual and pointed the finger at dry conditions caused by climate change. Evacuations and road closures remain in effect. About 900 residents were quickly evacuated. A coalition of teachers, students, and parents opposing the closure of seven Oakland schools have filed a CEQA lawsuit against the Oakland Unified School District, alleging it failed to adequately consider the environmental health impacts of school closures on youth under the state's Environmental Quality Act. Pecolia Mangio Adubu with the Justice for Oakland Students Coalition said in a statement, the district, quote, needs to start over in a thoughtful and lawful process that protects not just its students, but the East Oakland communities already suffering from asthma and other health issues related to pollution and emissions before closing schools that our families can walk to. I'm Christina Onestead reporting for KPFA. are back. Welcome back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. In his latest publication, Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet, Dr. Matthew T. Huber makes the case that the climate crisis is more than just a problem on the physical level, the scientific space, but that it is a crisis in the ideological space, more specifically, the political realm. How so? Well, he's here to talk about it, Dr. Matthew T. Hubbard. Welcome to A Rude Awakening. Wonderful to have you here to talk about your latest book. Thanks so much for having me. Good people. Dr. Matthew Huber is a professor of geography in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. He is the author of Lifeblood and a frequent contributor to Jacobin Magazine. Now, Dr. Huber, to surmise, you state that it's a question of power. And we need to build power to take on some of the wealthiest corporations in world history. And that's quoted straight from your book. So let's jump into it. Um, That is the truth. That is the truth. And you outline three ways this must be done uh, through production. Uh, through who shapes the climate movement, which is uh, specifically the professional class Mm -hmm. and their sole focus on knowledge. And number three, the need for a mass popular movement in order to defeat entrenched power. So talk to us about it. Yeah. So um, as you said, it's, it's really a question of power and particularly power over who controls, um, you know, 
energy production for one thing, but it's really about our kind of larger industrial system of production um, because everything that we produce from food to clothing to electronics is related to our energy system. And so um, it really kind of struck me that when we go back to uh, a very kind of old school, uh, traditional definition of class from a, a socialist or Marxist perspective as defined by someone's relationship to the means of production or relationship to production, that that was actually a really good description of of the type of struggle we're facing because we really have to confront the owners and the people profiting off the production of energy um, and all sorts of those those kind of related industries that are extremely carbon intensive. And um, once I started kind of trying to think through this kind of class analysis, I started seeing a lot of other kind of class analysis in, in the literature from policy people and academics, and, and they were deploying a very different definition of class that really just looked at people's consumption and lifestyle practices and showing that rich people tend to consume more um, carb, like sort of have a higher carbon footprint. And that uh, conception of class really just looks at people's income, looks at their consumption. And it's very different than the one that that sort of more old school <laughs> socialist vision that's really focused on who controls, who who owns, who profits from production. And so I felt like I could make a kind of contribution by shifting our analysis, our class analysis of the climate crisis from cons consumers and carbon footprints and what I find to be a somewhat problematic kind of moralizing around people's lifestyle choices and whether or not they're virtuously low carbon enough or not, and really focus on who I think is truly um, in control of this energy system, which is those who, um, again, own and profit from production. And so, you know, when, when we start to look at uh, who's driving climate politics, trying to build this kind of movement that I would think we need to take on these the the small minority of people who own and profit from the energy system. I noticed there was another class story to tell, which is that the climate movement today is really driven by what I call in the book the professional class. And that's a class of people who basically marshal credentials uh, like degrees or um, education or licenses or they marshal credentials to carve out advantages in the labor market. And um, these are, you know, highly educated people. They're people like journalists, like scientists, like um, academics uh, and, and variety of government workers and NGO staffers. And if you start to look around and see who's driving the climate discourse, the movement, the advocacy, it's 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 very much this uh, this portion of society. And and this is a minority of society. It's really, you know, um, even in the richest country on the planet, the United States, only only about a little over a third of adults have a college education. Um, the vast majority of people in our society are not in this professional class. So um, and when I when you start to look at the the kinds of politics, the professional class types type uh, tries to espouse it, like you said before, it's a politics of knowledge. It's about belief or denial. It's about um, uh, really complicated technocratic policy fixes like carbon taxes or carbon pricing. And, and ultimately, uh, like I say, it's, it, it can sometimes also be a real moralizing politics that tries to, um, again, sort of villainize people for high carbon consumption practices and talk about consuming less and, 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 and austerity in, in, in the end. And so I argue that all these kind of political strategies and rhetorical um, f focuses really don't have the capacity to, to build a broader, like you said, popular majoritarian democratic movement that you would kind of need to build this kind of mass politics that could uh, could actually overcome the power of that first class, the capitalists that own and control production. Um, so that what I, the third kind of class story that I want to tell is how to build this kind of working class movement, how to reach 
that, you know, roughly two thirds of, of our country that aren't college educated, that don't know the climate science, but are in large part struggling to get by in, in um, a highly, you know, gilded age type economy, very unequal economy where a huge bulk of society is just living paycheck to paycheck, is struggling to afford the basics of existence like healthcare and housing and and food and um, energy. <laughs> And, and, you know, all these things that the working class really struggles to afford, and especially now with inflation, um, these are the things we need to decarbonize. Either these are the things we need to, like, confront um, to address the climate crisis. So I try to argue a working class climate program would not so much be focused on how people need to, you know, uh, you know, really trim their carbon footprint or do all this stuff, but actually would be a more kind of... Um, positive story of rolling out public goods um, that uh, give people cheaper access to these fundamental things while greening and decarbonizing those those sectors at the same time. And so to me, the Green New Deal and what came around under the banner of that with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and and um, the Sunrise Movement was sort of like a at least an initial vision of that kind of working class politics that would ground itself in universal public goods and actually material gains and improvements to people's lives. Um, but ultimately, um, that that vision was just that it was a vision and we weren't able to build the kind of power to win that kind of massive implementation of a Green New Deal type uh, public sector led um uh, climate program. So now we're kind of stuck trying to, um, you know, look at other strategies to build a working class climate movement. And so um, the other thing I mention in the book is that ultimately a working class strategy is going to also be grounded in the labor movement. And um, uh, the in that respect, we actually can see that the, the epicenter of any strategy to decarbonize our society, is, as probably many of your listeners know, is electricity, right? You have to clean up the electric sector and then you have to electrify everything else. And um, when I started looking at this, I actually was quite surprised to learn how the electric utility sector in the United States is actually one of the more unionized parts of the entire economy. It has nearly 25% union density and it's, um, you know, in a very, uh, in a context where, where unions are on decline and, and weak, they're actually somewhat strong in this very sector that we need to transform. So, um, but, you know, these unions are also somewhat conservative and sometimes aligned with the fossil fuel interests in the utility industry. So uh, for socialists and for climate activists, uh, there's going to be a real effort to try to work with these unions, sometimes even work in these unions to build up, build up more of a kind of radical militant climate politics that can um, ultimately convince these unions that if they don't, if they don't um, start thinking proactively and strategically about their own union survival and membership, that they are in danger of losing out in this looming energy transition uh, uh, to, you know, which could happen in a very anti-union way. There's currently um, right now um, not uh, the renewable energy industry is not particularly friendly toward unions. It's not a very good place for unions to organize. And, and so uh, I think what I argue in the book is that the, the climate movement will have to kind of make the case to these electric unions that, you know, they need to think long term, think strategically about how to use their existing power to force the energy transition to be one that is uh, has unions right at the at, in the driver's seat <laughs> and really uh, making sure that the energy transition is one that grows the union movement and not one that decimates it. So, um so anyway, I'm sorry. What mm -hmm. I just did is sort of summarize like the entire book, and uh, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to uh, to elaborate on anything um, else and and any other sure. questions you have. Sure, absolutely. Well, I want to take the focus back to uh, where you. And I'm quoting the book. Um, unlike the working class professionals, um, because you break it down into two consequences for climate politics. Um, 
uh, working class versus uh, the professional class. And unlike the working class professionals occupy, and I quote, more advantaged segments of the labor market doing what Marxists often call mental labor, knowledge work, or cognitive labor. So yet from an ecological perspective, the knowledge economy is a specific post-industrial form of work defined by its temporal and spatial distance from industrial mass production, which is speaking to what you've already drilled down on with the energy sector. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of, uh, uh, and I was not aware uh, actually of the um, energy sector being as unionized as you, as you're stating and as your research uh, reveals. So there is this fight right now uh, mm -hmm. with the um, CPUC here in the state of California uh, and, and all over actually how uh, the, these electoral companies, they're, mm -hmm. they're fighting and pushing against folks who already have solar power. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, folks who've been listening to the show, they, they've heard uh, the uh, interview that I did with the uh, climate uh, climate center folks. Mm -hmm. And um, it, there is this, it's still hanging in the air as far as the state of California is concerned. Yeah. And um, they're fighting against people who have already have solar power. How can that be? You know, I mean, these folks who have been trying to do something, you know, to reduce their carbon footprint, there is that fight. So you're saying that there's also this other fight with these uh, labor unions right. uh, in regards to to pushing towards a more uh, climate friendly uh, solution. Um, I just, uh, that's absolutely terrifying and fascinating all at the same time. Let's drill down a little bit more on that. Is that what you're seeing in, in New York? Uh, that's my understanding you're in New York, right? Yeah, no, there's a lot of similar dynamics. Um, mm -hmm. And and from what I understand, the, uh, you know, the one of the main unions I'm talking about here is called the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, right. IBEW. And, um, and actually, I've seen, um, they are kind of like the flagship case of of union-led um, uh, green energy type projects. So they have been known for getting really big contracts for solar uh, utility scale solar projects. And, uh, you know, California is a very sunny place. And so that it's sort of like a, a success story of how unions have been able to um, uh, basically create this kind of solar energy transition on to their benefit. Um, but if you look around uh, the country, um, that's often not always the case. Um, there was a really powerful New York Times article. It's basically titled, Why Solar Farms Don't Build the Middle Class. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And um, and it talks about how in a lot of solar farms, if I recall, they were looking at some in Michigan. And a lot of them, you know, employ really insecure, transient, precarious labor. Um, they're, they're virulently anti-union. And the unions themselves understand that these, these um, solar farms or particularly like rooftop solar jobs are incredibly hard to unionize because they're spread out, they're transitory, they're decentralized. Um, and so the unions, when they can succeed, like in California, at, at creating these kind of union-led uh, green energy projects, they're, they're all about them. Uh, but they also, you know, if you listen to what they're saying, they, they're not, they're not really excited about, um, uh, shutting down, uh, uh, energy infrastructure that they have a lot of good paying jobs in already. So, um, again, we got to make the case to them that the green energy transition is going to be about building way more stuff and way more jobs and um, and it's going to benefit their their members. But if we just leave it to the market and we leave it to capitalism to figure out, I fear that a lot of the renewable energy development will continue to be run by very anti-union private capital and that won't be good for the unions. And so we need to kind of figure out a way to fight with the unions against that and build a union led energy transition. I mean, that's what Joe Biden says he wants. <laughs> he keeps saying that it's going to be good union jobs and, but, but you actually need some legal teeth behind that. And you actually need to exactly. mandate, mandate that it's union, good union jobs. Exactly. Exactly. Again, folks, again, <clears throat> it is my pleasure to be speaking with 
Dr. Matthew Huber. Now, Dr. Matthew Huber is a professor of geography in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. He's the author of Lifeblood and a frequent contributor to Jacobin Magazine. And we're talking about his latest publication entitled Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming planet and uh, we're going to end this segment right here but we will be back with more from dr matthew t huber and uh dr huber i want to go into um a, a coined phrase proletarianization mm. proletarianization <laughs> yeah love it love it love it folks stay tuned there is more to come okay good people this is a rude awakening once again. This is Fun Drive Friday, and we are going to have fun this Friday. Now, that was Dr. Matthew T. Huber, okay? And his book is talking about building socialism, socialism on a warming planet. I have one question for you, folks. One question for you. Where else can you hear open discussions on on the mic, on the radio, on the internet, about socialism. Okay, I should say on the dial. I should say on the dial because ninety four point one FM KPFA has been in that space, been occupying that broadcasting real estate for over seventy years, and has been having this conversation, this ongoing conversation about how to empower the people for over 70 years and you know who's been empowering us to empower you it's you community for and we, i need to i need to stress that uh, we need your help right now so if you could just give us a call 1-800-439-5732 1-800-439-5732 you can also go to kpfa.org and i'm hearing i think i'm hearing a knock once again here folks it's fun drive friday so you know what that means i think i think it's <laughs> here we go again anybody in there? <laughs> yeah hello, actually hello. yes yes kevin hello kevin, Ke kevin is that you did you bring your coffee this time because i, got, I, I ran my... out it, oh did, did you? you oh i, I, I wish i out. I got a full pot just brewed, uh, and it's in my lucky Aloha mug for Aloha Friday on Friday the 13th. So we're pulling out oh, all the... Oh, it's Friday the 13th. Oh, no. The best of luck. <laughs> the best of luck to you and yours. Yeah. You, you, of course it would be. Why wouldn't the first Friday of Fun Drive not be Friday the 13th? So I we're going right? to do this. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to make it happen. We have to make it happen. I tell you, I got so excited about, you know, I, I just, any Friday, any Fun Drive Friday with Kevin H uh -huh. is always a good time. I got so excited. I started to jump ahead of myself and give out the phone number without the 1 800 part. 1 800 439 5732. My dear friend and yours is here, Kevin Hunsinger. Oh my gosh, Kevin, thank you so much for stopping by. That's and um, I, I want to let you know, I, um, I, I, I was able, I was able, and I'm very, very grateful and thankful that I was able to donate last fund drive. I think it was for the birthday. I think it was a birthday fund drive. Yeah. So I saved up my nickels and dimes, and I got the banned books. Oh, wonderful. I got the banned books package, and I have to, okay, I should stop. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead of myself. Because we have an amazing book. We have we have Dr. Matthew T. Huber's book. It is amazing. It is so well done, well written, easy to understand. Then we'll talk about the banned books. But um, his book, it is entitled, once again, Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. That is what needs to happen. Um, he's got the answers. He's got the answers right here. Um, he's got an yeah, exactly, exactly. We this do isn't have just complaining a... about what's happening. This is a this is a roadmap to to solving these these climate crises and how we can all work together to make that happen. This is a really powerful work, and I love the interview. By the way, he's sharp. 
Yeah, he is very sharp. And what's interesting about the interview and about this book is that he explores that whole, uh, the, the second one. There's three three ways, three avenues that we need to take in order to get to where we need to go as far as solving this climate crisis, right? And so he starts talking about the professional class and how they're like professionally knowledgeable. And that's right. all they are is professionally knowledgeable. Right. So it's just, you know, it's like this echo chamber, you know, this biome of, I know more, a little bit more than you do. And did you hear about that? You know, it's mm-hmm. like, it, okay, great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to know that all this is going on. But what are we doing about it? What is being done? What are the concrete solutions that are being employed to take us where we need to go mm-hmm. so that we can save ourselves? So we can keep the sky, the, the proverbial sky from falling on our heads. 1-800-439-5732. Again, the book is Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet, kpfa.org. You can donate securely online as well. So, um, what is the what are we looking at as far as uh, fifty dollars for the book? One hundred fifty. Uh, we have a suggested minimum donation of one twenty five for that for a class war or climate change as class war okay. by Dr. Hubner. Um, and and in that, you know, he talks about how everybody really does need to work together to elevate ourselves and to to solve this climate crisis. That yeah. you know, we, yeah. we we all have the power within within ourselves as communities, and that's mm-hmm. exactly what KPFA has, and that's what we've had for seventy three years. The power is within our community. I can't to keep it's us crazy. elevated, to keep us yeah. afloat, and yeah. uh, it's 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 as present here as it is in climate change, as it is in many other aspects of the world right now. If we really stop and think about it, the only way we can all succeed is when we pitch in together to help each other. And we need your support, listeners. We need your support now at kpfa.org to uh, to help keep us going, to help us accomplish our fundraising goal. And it is a lot. It's five hundred thousand dollars this round. So. <laughs> $125 donation and accept uh, Dr. Hubner's climate change as class war would go a long way towards helping us accomplish that goal. If we had everybody pitch in a little bit, we'll get there in no time. But we do need your help. And you can do that by visiting kpfa.org, selecting Dr. Hubner's climate change as class war. Call 1-800-439-5732. Is that funny? Is that funny that I'm asking for money? <laughs> we need it. I don't, I'm, I, I've got my hat in hand. I've got my coffee mug in one hand and my hat in the other. And I'm asking for our listeners' support because that's what KPFA is founded on. That's what's kept us going for all these years. And that's what's going to bring us into the future. No, it's Huber. It's Am Dr. I right? Yeah, no, you're totally right. It's Dr. Matthew Huber, 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 as in mm-hmm. hubris, but Huber. Yes. Did I say Huber? No, I no, said you- Huber. <laughs> I had it right. I listen. <laughs> it's an amazing book, folks. It is amazing. And you know what? Listen, listen. KPFA is here to provide you with unfiltered news and analysis. I cannot stress that enough. If you go to the very first page, kpfa.org, kpfa.org. That splash page, it says it right there. I'm going to read it to you. KPFA is here to provide you with unfiltered news and analysis. Join us in giving agency to the voice of the people. People. And please do what you can to help support our work. It's right there on our splash page, kpfa.org. You can donate securely. Again, the book that we are offering for $125 donation is a gift that will keep on giving. If you are an educator, if you're an educator on any level, talking about the climate, uh, talking to your seventh or eighth graders about the climate, uh, if you're a geography uh, professor and, and like Dr. Huber, Listen to this. Climate change is class war. Building socialism on a warming planet. Dr. Matthew T. Huber is asking the question, why the struggle against climate change is a class struggle? Why? Because the climate crisis is not primarily a problem of believing science or individual carbon footprints. It is a class problem rooted in who owns, controls, and profits from material production. As such, it will take a class struggle to solve it. Okay, folks, that's what KPFA is all about. That's what community is all about. And we've been about bringing the community together for over 70 years, 73 years, Kevin. Indeed. That's a long 
time. That mm-hmm. is a long time. We want to keep doing it. We want to keep doing it. Now, this spring fund drive, it, it, it's a it's a huge, huge, huge battle. It's an uphill battle. And uh, this is the first week of it. This is my first Friday. Mm-hmm. And I want to try to make a difference. I really do. 1-800-439-5732. Uh, we've got another segment. we got another segment to this interview with Dr. Matthew T. Huber. And we are going to, I think we're going to go ahead and jump into it right now. Unless you got something to say, Kevin H., what's going on? I, 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 I wanna, hear, you, I hear I you bubbling over there. I hear you bubbling. I hear you. I do want to thank our listeners and our supporters. We've, we've had a really good foundation for this drive yeah. this week. Uh, we've been hitting our goals and we can uh, we can really yeah. get there. You know, if we keep chipping in, uh, we will get there. Uh, I've made a donation this this round. I'm a sustaining donor, um, but mm-hmm. I know that every little bit helps. So, you know, I put my I put my bid in and, uh, and I really hope that everyone else uh, does their share too. If you can afford it, please visit kpfa.org and make that donation today or call 1-800-439-5732. And I do realize that it's not Dr. Hubner. I saw what I did there. <laughs> it's Huber. Huber. And uh, it is very good. He's so engaging and such an intelligent uh, speaker. So yeah, let's get back to that interview yes. and, uh, and allow folks to call 1-800-439-5732 without our interruption. Yes, exactly. Take it away, Man of Steel Rod Keel. And we are back. We're talking to Dr. Matthew T. Huber. And uh, his latest book is Climate Change is Class War, Building Social- Socialism on a Warming Planet. So this is just, um, I think this is amazing. It's beautiful. It is a new perspective. Mm-hmm. that has been, you know, batted around. But uh, as you stated, and as we spoke about um, in the last segment, the professional class is just talking about it. The professional class is knowledgeable of it. Mm-hmm. But what about actually putting forth, putting some teeth into it, mm-hmm. action, taking mm-hmm. action, right? Mm-hmm. So proletarianization, proletarianization is what you talk about and discuss in your book. And I think that's a, that's, that's an action word. It's a, it's a verb, right? <laughs> so <laughs> talk to us about how, let's state, let's put it this way. In your analysis, you are clearly stating that it's all about empowerment. Mm-hmm. So describe mm-hmm. how one would go about doing that. Mm-hmm. For example, how how would how could someone go about piquing the interest of say a single black mother of three mm. that's working two jobs? Yeah, and she's uh, she does live on the front lines of uh, the, the uh, re- local refinery, and uh, two right. other kids have you know they have uh, they have asthma or they they've got uh, you know signs of having asthma and. and uh, whatnot, and uh, all of a sudden, it's like, uh, uh, you know, she has to take action. But the only right. action she can take is ensuring that she has some type of health care to take care of those babies. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, how how are we going to empower her? How are we going to empower those folks? Uh, yeah, I really not through proletarianization. How are we going to proletarianize that uh-huh. single black mother of three? Go ahead. So, I really love how you put that because I think it gets to the the heart of the matter. Um, uh, I would say actually a lot of people in the climate um, advocacy community, which again are driven largely by professional NGOs and academics, people I hang out with all the time. (laughs) Uh, These people are very attuned to the, to the issues of environmental injustice that you mentioned of people that are suffering direct environmental harms from fossil fuel infrastructure and the sort of frontline communities that are facing toxic pollution and um, uh, and are really in need of this energy transition more than anyone else. Um, but what I argue is that that form, uh, in a, uh, I call it kind of livelihood environmentalism that, that says environmental politics has to kind of come from some sort of direct environmental harm. Uh, the problem is that I argue under capitalism, the main threat to most people's lives is not always direct environmental harm, but just simply trying to get enough money to survive. <laughs> so the market is the, the most 
direct threat to people's everyday existence. That that fact that they have to work those two jobs just to get food on the table, to pay for the health care, to pay for the rent. And so the the term you mentioned, proletarianization, which I should be clear, is not mine. It's <laughs> Karl Marx is the one who came up with this idea, which is essentially what he he lived through this 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 incredibly new historical process of what he called proletarianization, which means tearing the masses of people from the land <laughs> and from a social relation to the land where they rely directly on the land for their subsistence and for their livelihood. And what that does is it throws people into this situation where they're now proletarianized and they have no other way to survive besides getting someone to pay them a wage or some sort of income to access the stuff they need through the market, like food and housing and, and clothing. And so what I argue is that capitalism by tearing all these people from the land and from direct ecological relationships actually creates this proletarian insecurity that's fundamental to working class life, which means the mass of the working class under capitalism really struggles to to obtain these these basic things of life that we should you know we should think about ecology as not just about fish and lions and trees it's people <laughs> and people to survive in capitalism need to get money to survive and and that means they're fundamentally insecure so what i argue is that if we want to build a mass working class climate politics we absolutely need to focus on the frontline communities that are facing pollution and toxic threats to their life. But we also need to find a way to reach the people who are just trying to get by. Um, and in this every, more everyday struggle materially with the market and trying to afford a living, you know, I think uh, in France, when um, Macron passed a carbon tax, uh, the, the yellow vest movement, the gilet jaune, they, they said it really well. They said politicians only, they want us to care about the end of the world, but we care about the end of the month. Right? <laughs> They're trying to, <laughs> to, to meet their bills. To, and so what I argue in the book is that, yes, we need to, to confront the frontline communities and the toxic threats to their life, but we also need a narrative and a politics that can just be about appealing to people's more um, um, financial needs. So like you said, Those like, needs. yeah, Medicare for all, there's been a lot of effort to try to fold together a public housing program that would be also green housing and retrofitted climate friendly housing. But obviously the, the main thing is energy, right? And right now with inflation, everyone's really struggling to pay their utility bills. And if climate, if climate, uh, if we could put together a climate program, that's about giving people cheaper utility bills and giving people even socialists would dream about decommodified energy as a human right, you know, electricity as a human right. Mm -hmm. These types of programs can really actually reach millions of people who are struggling to pay their bills, who are struggling to get to the end of the month. And that can start to build that mass movement that we need and actually help confront the power of the fossil fuel interest and companies who, who run those, those horrible refineries and those chemical plants that are threatening frontline communities, right? So um, to build the power to take them on, we need a broader uh, mass uh, politics about people's um, uh, proletarian insecurity and in, in meeting their basic needs. So. No doubt, no doubt. And the French know how to put on a protest, I tell you. <laughs> For that sure. Beautiful. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, One. <laughs> it seemed like every day it was like, you know, something was happening. I was like, it was constantly in the YouTube feed. Constantly. constantly. <laughs> One thing I learned is that the electrical unions over there, they were able to shut off the power to Amazon warehouses to uh, try to <laughs> During the Christmas season. No. Yeah. So they, they know how to use the power of labor to force people to listen to their demands. That's amazing. Most, most yeah. definitely use that power against them, literally, yeah. right? Exactly. That is too funny. That is, I, I did not know that part. I did not know that part. And that's why I'm talking to Dr. Matthew T. Huber, folks. Dr. Matthew T. Huber. So it's it's a long game, but we don't have time. Right. That, that, that's what I'm, I'm getting from. And we need a different approach. We need a better approach. And this Marxist approach that you put forth in your book, again, folks, it's entitled Climate Change is Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. Is that path forward? Is that way out 
of this darkness that we see ourselves in. But it seems like to me, um, Matthew, that uh, it's going to take some big existential, mm. you know, dive off of a cliff, <laughs> push off of a cliff mm -hmm. in order to get folks to understand or get these people in power, this minority that's in power, these multinational corporations, these quasi-governmental agencies that are just lining their pockets left mm -hmm. and right mm -hmm. with our hard-earned money, our hard-earned cash, our, our, our labor. Mm -hmm. It's going to take something that's going to threaten them. Right. To get them to wake up. Your thoughts, and we're going to close in about two minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I agree. Um, we need something. The, the working class has been quite defeated and demobilized for decades now. Um, but I actually, um, you know, you can look in history and see how these types of, you know, existential crises like the Great Depression of the 1930s was able to like awake a uh, working class movement from somewhat of a defeated state in the late 1920s and into a, an extremely powerful um, uh, labor movement that was organizing strikes um, all over the country, including in uh, the San Francisco general strikes that basically shut down a lot of cities across the country and forced you know, the New Deal had put forward some pretty marginal labor uh, reforms, but once this sort of strike wave of 1934 happened, it it was clear they had to do something way bigger. And, you know, lo and behold, the National Labor Relations Act came in 1935. And um, now there's some dangerous stories about how the radical parts of that movement were neutralized by the Democratic Party and by FDR in the years that followed. But mm -hmm. I think we have to look back to those moments of working class insurgency and try to see how we can um, try to build that kind of energy, which, again, um, uses the power of workers to withhold their labor to force, as, as Jane McAlevey says, to really force a crisis on society. I mean, we've seen this recently when the West Virginia teachers went on strike, they shut down the entire school system in West Virginia. They won their demands within a couple of weeks, <laughs> you know? So if they had gone the normal route of trying to lobby for these changes with the, you know, like getting the right people elected, it would have taken a lot longer. So, um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We look to history and, um, and I'm hopeful we can uh, start to, to build this movement and, and try to start winning this fight. No compromise. Exactly. Yeah. No compromise. There cannot be any compromise at all. And I think that's what uh, what we all have to uh, understand and start mobilizing towards, start start building towards quickly, quick, fast, in a hurry. Because we, we don't have time. Absolutely. We don't have time. And I, I think just across the board, just across the board, as far as... Um, making a living the working class the, the 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 labor that goes behind it you know there are so many changes there's there's such a domino effect in in the positive in the positive that can happen not just with the climate crisis but across the board and i think uh once uh once we're able to to push that realization onto the masses they they're gonna they're gonna jump to it they're gonna jump to it but there has to be there has to be that safety net for mm -hmm the moms out there, the single mothers out there, the single fathers out there, the single people who are trying to raise a family and take care of their folks uh, individually, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be across the board. So, wow, it's a great map to to um, to a better future. And uh, Dr. Matthew T. Huber, I, I, you've got it. You've got it. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this strategy going. Let's make this happen. But we got to end it here, unfortunately. But fortunately, you are open to coming back. So I'm going to hold you to it. Absolutely. This conversation needs to keep happening. We need to get the word out to folks to empower them to make the best of their future. Dr. Matthew T. Hoover, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. I truly appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. It was really fun. Thanks for having me. Oh, it was an amazing conversation with Dr. Matthew T. Huber. I tell you, it was an amazing conversation. Folks, $125. If you give that to us, we'll give you the book, Climate Change is Glass War, Building Socialism on a Warming 
planet. I tell you, the answers are all here in this book. If you're an educator, again, folks, if you're an educator, this book is going to help your students have a better understanding of kind of the direction, I would say, where they're going as far as the Green New Deal. I mean, it needs to be greener and 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 newer, if, in my opinion. But uh, that's the direction. That's that's the that's the that's the um, that's what they were positing in the Green New Deal. Um, trying to at least. This goes deeper. It goes uh, it goes all the way where it needs to be as far as where we need to be as a society. Socialism is going to help us all. Kevin H is yes, here. Yes. Here with me, I'm Sabrina Jacobs. This is A Rude Awakening. Kevin H., he's our, our tireless, tireless development director. We're at 8.49 a.m. And we got to take it to the home stretch. We've got to take it to the home stretch. There's nobody. There's nobody on the phone. I don't know if there's anybody that's online at kpfa.org. Again, the phone number 1-800-439-5732. I've been pushing for the website. If you good people can go to the website, kpfa.org. You can donate securely there. Yep. And um, yeah, 125 bucks gets you this book. I mean, well, hell, 50 bucks. I mean, whatever you got, if you've got it, great, wonderful. We got five hundred dollars. Excuse me, five hundred thousand dollars. That's our goal, and it takes, which I did not know. I just found this out. It costs about five hundred dollars per hour, twenty-four hours a day, oh, yeah. seven days a week, to keep KPFA going. Sure. Never broke down the numbers. Did not know that. We work on a shoestring budget, and and we're committed to paying a living wage and providing benefits to our workers, and that costs money. And we own our building still. Luckily, we still own our building, and that requires constant maintenance. And we just upgraded to studios from analog to digital. Okay, we're 20 years behind doing this, and we just were able to complete that conversion. And we need to update our website. It's it's beautiful. Um, Quincy McCoy, our, our general manager, did an amazing job getting it to where it is. But, you know, we're trying to keep up with the times. Well, and it, it costs a lot of money, $500 mm -hmm. per hour. I did not mm -hmm. know that. Kevin mm -hmm. H., thank you for sure. breaking down those numbers. Thank you so much. Well, you know, that's that's not just me. That we've got a we've got a great business department. And, you know, when we when we yes, establish these we goals do. for these we fund do. drives, this these aren't arbitrary numbers. We don't just throw like a dart at a wall of, of you know, <laughs> uh, go like, oh, what do we want to do? It's five hundred thousand dollars sounds good. No, these are real actual numbers that we need to keep the station going. So mm -hmm. uh and, and that five hundred dollars an hour budget, that's legitimate. And that also doesn't take into account just the tireless work of volunteers. Yeah. You know that that donate yeah. their time, their energy, right. the passion of their lives. You know to 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 uh, to to chip in and help KPFA go. So there are a lot of ways that you can support KPFA, and there are a lot of ways that people do support KPFA. But right now, the most important way is visiting kpfa.org and making a donation. You know we do have that call center because uh, we are still in a pandemic. We yeah. do have to uh, yeah. have a skeleton staff. So we don't have those volunteers able to answer the phones. Now we do go to an outside call center. That's money. That costs KPFA every yeah. day, every call. But we're there for you. So if you'd like to call in, please do so. As you were saying, Sabrina, there's nobody on the line. So there won't be a busy signal. 1-800-439-5732. And make that mm -hmm. pledge. Help keep KPFA keeping on. And you can accept Dr. Matthew Huber's book, <laughs> Climate Change as Class War, for a donation of $125. We have all kinds of gifts. Yes. Uh, thank you gifts available. You know, one of the, uh, another focused uh, premium that we have uh, available is the DVD, Requiem for the American Dream. Uh, oh. Noam Chomsky's, uh, yes. you know, uh, last long interview uh, about uh, class inequality. And just the parallels are so striking between this documentary and Dr. Huber's book and really what yeah. KPFA is all about. It just reinforces right. again the solidarity of our listeners, the solidarity of our community and what KPFA has managed to do for 73 years. What a miraculous endeavor and it really is, uh, it's, it's worthy of many books to tell KPFA's history and mm -hmm. what we've managed to accomplish with our listeners support. A hundred percent 
listener-supported radio like nowhere else on earth. And yeah. it does require the support of our listeners. Unfortunately, true, but you can make that difference now. If you are able to donate today, do so at 1-800-439-5732. We still don't have a caller on the line, so there's nothing to, to wait. You know, you'll just get right through. You can make that donation today. 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org. Look around for a little bit. See some other uh, focus, you know, some other premiums available to you, like that Requiem for the American Dream DVD, or like our new mm -hmm. spring band book bag bundle with I five love new how you titles. guys are changing it up every season. I love how you guys are doing that. I think that's you no. Know, I wish we didn't wonderful. have to though. Really? I wish there yeah. weren't so many books being banned. You know, <laughs> these these books are called from the most banned books of 2021. What? So the new additions to this, oh. including you know George, uh, well, which the is the color young purple. Adult, the color purple is perennially banned every year. That makes the top ten oh, list of challenge God. books about you know according to the American Library Association. Uh, I wish we didn't have mm -hmm. to upgrade mm -hmm. this. I wish we didn't have to change these books. I wish that this uh, this just capricious book banning. They're just trying mm -hmm. to support their agenda. These mm -hmm. were wonderful, powerful books that really inform and educate and, uh, and and give a different perspective about life. That's what KPFA does. We try to show you different things, That's a different right. side of the story. You know, KPFA, yeah. we want you to know. We're mm -hmm. not trying to hide the facts. We're trying to share the facts. And that's a founding principle of this station. Lou Hill, right out of the gate, decided to not talk down to our listeners, to mm. not treat our supporters like dummies. You that's know, we, we, we provide you with the education. We provide you with the knowledge. And we give you the, the information to make your own decisions and to do the right thing in life. And to do the right thing in life right now, unfortunately, is to support KPFA. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes you don't want to. But sometimes it's time to chip in and mm -hmm. now's the time kpfa.org make that donation or 1-800-439-5732 yep. i got confidence i got confidence kevin i got confidence in our, our people Same. i got confidence in our community and i got confidence in this community that i have been trying to build and i have not been doing it alone I've been doing it with KPFA. It hasn't been just the standalone podcast. I've got 73 years of history backing me up every Friday at 8 a.m. Delivering unfiltered, that unfiltered conversation with you folks. Again, are you, can you turn on MSNBC and have a conversation, an open, unfiltered conversation about socialism like I just did with Matthew I mean, Dr. Huber, he's, 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 he's taken his whole career and fashioned it around, you know, the answers, the answers to our social ills. And I tell you, it's not an easy thing. Socialism isn't popular. It isn't popular. I mean, you can turn on that same old MSNBC and see those Republicans popping off, you know, like they've got the answers. They don't have the answers. They don't give a crap. MSNBC, they kind of have the answers once in a while when you turn them on. CNN, I don't know what's going on with them, you know. Right. You're going right. to have that conversation with, you're going to be able to have that conversation with people here at KPFA, mm -hmm. right? With the call-in shows. I hope to get that going as soon as possible. I'm still working on it. Technical difficulties, coronavirus restrictions, it will happen. It will sure. happen because I want to talk to you folks. I, I really want to have that conversation with you about your thoughts on the climate crisis. To have that unfiltered conversation is so important right now. So important. Why? Because it empowers you and then it empowers me too as a host because I'm learning. I'm learning about what you want to hear. I'm learning about what you need to know. I'm learning about what is going to empower you as a community. 1-800-439-5732 KPFA dot O-R-G. You know, Kevin H., I tell you, um, I, it's just uh, the education that I've gotten. I'll give 45 seconds here to <laughs> do a yes. little bit of my background. Um, it's been 12 years. And I tell you, I've learned so much, so much from the guests that I have had the opportunity of interviewing um, the subject matter. Uh, just being exposed to this whole other side of life, this whole other side of the world that I didn't know existed, you know, which which is, uh, I would say, the foundation of a lot of it has been the 
the thought or the possibility of socialism. You know, we do have some social safety nets, but I tell you, they're they're slipping away. They're slipping away. We've yep. got to have the conversation. one 800 439 We're coming up on the TLN. Kevin H., give it 10 seconds, and I'm going to close this out. Well, I just I just want to thank everybody for their support and, and encourage you to keep supporting us because we want to be there to support you. 1-800-439-5732, kpfa.org. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Rod. It's been a pleasure to join you. Yes. And uh, yeah, thank you, listeners. Yes. Thank you for all that you do for us. Absolutely. Rod Akeel, Man Steel on the controls. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. This is A Rude Awakening. KPFA is also heard on KPFB 89.3 FM in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, K248BR 97.5 FM in Santa Cruz and online at KPFA.org. Stay tuned for Democracy Now! coming up next. We love you. Keep giving 1-800-439-5732, KPFA.org. You can give securely and it is 